Hi, I'm Jim Shaw. And I'm Bridget O'Rourke. Welcome to the video version of our Hypermedia Joy Studies article, Can the Sea Boy Speak? The Hindu Sea Boy as Anti-Colonial Indic-Irish Insurgent in Finnegan's Wake. In this talk, originally presented at the 2019 Joyce Symposium in Mexico City, Jim Shaw and I explore the mashup of Irish and Indian struggles for political independence, spiritual liberation, and psychoanalytic release in James Joyce's masterpiece, Finnegan's Wake. This mashup is shown most clearly in the figure of the Hindu Shimar Shin, who takes up arms against British imperialism, first in the Musy Room episode and later in the shooting of the Russian general episode as told by Button Taff. The term sepoy refers to a soldier from the colonized people serving in the imperialist army. For example, an Indian or Irish soldier serving in the British army. The word sepoy comes from Persian and Indic sources and refers originally to cavalrymen. The term came to mean specifically Indian soldiers fighting within and for the British Army. Sepoys comprised the overwhelming majority of soldiers in the British Army and the Army of the British East India Company as its avatar in India, which was used to secure the British domination of the Indian subcontinent. Sepoys also comprised a significant percentage of the British fighting forces in its many imperialist wars, including those against Napoleon and World Wars I and II. In the Musy Room episode, the Hindu sea boy rebels against British colonial power by throwing a bomb and dehorsing Wellington during the Battle of Waterloo. This is the sea boy, Madras Hataras, up jumpin' pumpin', cry to the willing dun, up pukaru, puka Europe. Later in the Russian general episode, delivered by Button Taff, another such figure accomplishes the insurrectionary act of shooting the Russian general which prepares for the next generation to take his place. As we will show these paired acts of insurrection against colonial rule, reenact the archetypal Oedipal drama. The political drama is merged with the psychoanalytic. Furthermore, we argue that the Sepoy Revolt and its counterpart in the Button Taff episode represent a further development. Political and psychoanalytic revolution are further merged with spiritual liberation. This is the meaning of Swadesha Salve in the Hindu tradition. With Button Taff combined fully in the aftermath of the shooting of the Russian general, Joyce merges several dynamic psychoanalytical, historical, and spiritual complexes. The psychosexual Oedipal project, Freud, the insurrection of proletarian revolution, Marx, and the yogic tantric path to liberation. However, what we have in the Button Taff episode is far from a resolution of the contradictions underlying these complexes. The post-Oedipal colonial tantric self remains profoundly neurotic, oppressed, and unenlightened. More work must be done. The cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara in yogic terms, continues. The title of our inquiry, Can the Sepoy Speak? draws on post-colonial analysis and criticism of Finnegan's Wake by Vincent Chang, Gayatri Spivak, and others. In her groundbreaking post-colonial essay, Spivak poses the question, inside and outside the circuit of the epistemic violence of imperialist law and education, can the subaltern speak? We revise Spivak's provocative question asking, can the sepoy speak? And if so, how? Ferrell Gazul points out, both in English and Italian, the term subaltern stands for a military rank that indicates subordination. Vincent Chang adds that in Finnegan's Wake, the sepoy is literally and militaristically a colonial subaltern. In Spivak's formulation, elaborations of insurgency stand in the place of the utterance. She writes, when we come to the concomitant question of the consciousness of the subaltern, the notion of what the work cannot say becomes important. In the semiosis of the social text, elaborations of insurgency stand in the place of the utterance. The sender, the peasant, is marked only as a pointer to an irretrievable consciousness. In 
Finnegan's Wake, the sepoys speak through these elaborations of insurgency. We'll also show that Kate or the mistress Kata may be seen as a subaltern. She is literally and figuratively a pointer to an irretrievable consciousness. Swadesha Salve, Shin Fine. We ourselves. This is the English translation of the Sanskrit and Gaelic slogans that identified the Irish and Indian independence movements in the late 19th and through the 20th centuries to the current day. Joyce uses the phrase on page 594 of the wake in a section filled with Sanskrit terms. Ba, servarn, sir, scatter brand to the renewaler of the sky, thou who ignitest. Da, Arcturus coming, be, verb unprincipient through the transitive spaces. Kilt by Kelt shall kith again with kin again, we elect for thee, Turt Angel. Swadesia salve. Swadesia salve. Only we can save ourselves. But this section is really a call to a great new leader, a renascent HCE, to lead the Dubliners on the path to the light, to the Heliotropolis. We examined this section in some depth in our previous Hypermedia Joy Studies article, The Yoga of Finnegan's Wake. It reads as if it's straight from the Rig Veda, the most ancient of Hindu and in fact all extant Indo-European spiritual texts. Joyce has written this closely mimicking the Rig Veda, but it can be just as easily read as a call to insurrection against the colonial overlord the Irish and Indians share, the British. On the preceding page of the wake, book four opens with the Sanskrit word sandhyas repeated three times. This indicates we are in a moment of pause between great ages in the Vikonian sense, or yugas in the yogic or Vedic sense. Sandhyas, 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 calling all downs, calling all downs to Dane. Array, surrection, ire weaker to the old blood and world. O rally, O rally, O rally, flanks the O rally. To what life like thine of the bird can be? Seek you so many matters. Haze sea east to Oceana. Here, here. This is a call to the beginning of a new day or dawn, rising like a phoenix from the ashes, an uprising or insurrection, array, surrection. It is a call to revolution and spiritual liberation, an insurrection and a resurrection. We are directed to look to the east with a reference to HCE. And then, Sean Fein, Sean Fein Avant. Sinn Fein, Sinn Fein Avant may be translated into English as ourselves alone, onward. So in the opening pages of book four, we hear the revolutionary Irish call to rise up in insurrection, which leads directly to a section filled with Sanskrit and referencing the Indian nationalist and anti-colonial, anti-British Swadeshi movement. Swadeshi Salve is effectively synonymous with Sinn Féin Awang. Kate O'Malley has described the extensive historical connections between the Irish and Indian independence movements during the first half of the 20th century. The Indian-Irish Independence League was founded in 1932 with a view to work by every possible means to secure the complete independence of India and Ireland, and to achieve the closest solidarity between the Irish and the Indian masses in their common struggle against British imperialism. Joyce was surely aware of the movement to unify Sinn Féin with the Swadesi movement, if only because W.P. Yeats's girlfriend, Maud Gaughan, was a key player in the movement. We find a reference to the Indian textile boycott in the Musy Room episode of The Wake. And the Lapoleums is going boycotting crazy onto the one willing done. And the call ourselves alone of Sinn Féin and Swadesha Salve reappears in the Norwegian Captain episode, along with a reference to the 1932 Bass Ale boycott, which was led by Irish Republicans, including Maud Gunn. Our swalves, our swalves of ruin, we rescue thee, O Bass, from the damp earth and honor thee, O Connabel, 
with mouth burial, so was done neat and trig, up draft and wet them. The Swadeshi movement was an expression of Indian national opposition to British dominance starting in the middle of the 19th century. It was especially focused on the boycott of imported British goods, especially clothing. The movement was concomitant with militant uprisings at the same time, including the 1857 Sepoy Mutiny, in which many thousands of British and tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of Indians were killed including sadistic executions by, of rebels tied to cannons after the suppression. Known as India's first war of independence, it was triggered by perceived religious offenses, including especially outrage over the newly introduced Enfield rifle, which was required the sepoy to bite off the end to release the powder. It was believed that the grease used in the cartridges contained beef and pork fat, thus offending both Hindus and Muslims. This uprising was suppressed after two years of fighting, but became and remains a cherished expression of Indian nationalism. We now turn to the music room episode. For her passkey supplied to the janitrix, the mistress Kata. Tip, this the way to the music room. Mind your hats going in. This reference to Kate as our guide to the museum focused on the Battle of Waterloo contains an unusual spelling which suggests the Kata Upanishad. In this famous Hindu text, we find the compelling aphorism Tat Tram Asi, often translated as Thou Art That. It appears in the wake as From Thee to Thee, Thou Art It Thou, That Thouest There. Joyce ties Tat Tram Asi to another Hindu aphorism, Atman is Brahman. The underlying nature of the self is one with the underlying nature of the universe. They are one and the same. Thou art that. Joyce directly quotes these aphorisms in Book 4. The Kata Upanishad is also the first place in Hindu literature where the word yoga is used specifically to refer to this meditational discipline leading to awareness or enlightenment, moksha, or freedom, liberation. Kate is also noted as having another key, this time to freedom, liberation, or moksha, as Joyce refers to the four essential aims of life in yogic Hindu thought and practice. And so it all ended. Arta, Kama, Dharma, Moksha. Ask Kavya for the K. These are the four essential goals of life. Success, pleasure, path, and liberation. And they are presented by Joyce in Sanskrit without alteration or syncretization. So the mistress Kate, here Kavya, brings the key to the Musi room, the key to the essential knowledge of the Kata Upanishad, and the key to the essential aims of life in Hinduism. Kavya is Sanskrit for an epic poem and refers typically to the great Hindu epics, the Ramayana, which Joyce quotes closely in Book 4, and the Mahabharata, of which the well-known Bhagavad Gita is a part. We see here that the mistress Kata is marked as a sender in Spivak's terms, a pointer to an irretrievable consciousness. She's always pointing the way. Kate is also associated with the Biddy Doran figure, the hen who immediately after the Musee Room episode scratches out the letter from the midden heap. In a sense, it's Kate who introduces us to the letter, also then to the Book of Kells, to the Kata Upanishad, and other essential Hindu texts as well as the wake itself. He guides us through the music room, detailing images and storylines from the Battle of Waterloo, and arguably all battles of history, a great many of which, especially those involving Wellington and or Napoleon, are mentioned. We encounter the Duke of Wellington on his big, wide horse, Napoleon with his triple one hat, the Prussians, Prussians, and we have... This is the three Napoleon born grouching down in the living Dutch. Three young cadets from the living ditches or bogs of Ireland and elsewhere, that is, three sepoys, three soldiers in the British Army hailing from colonized nations, Ireland in particular. And of course, the Ginnies. The Ginnies is a coup in her hand, and the Ginnies is a rave in her hair, and the willing done get the band up. The Ginnies seem to egg on the sepoys while giving Wellington an erection. Get the band up. 
that the music room scene is also an iteration of the incident in the park is also quite apparent here. As the battle scene is described, we come to a confrontation between the sepoys and Wellington on his big white horse. Stonewall willing done is an old maxi mantra many. Lepoleums is nice hung bushelers. This is Hyena Hennessy laughing aloud at the willing done. This is Lipsig Dooley craigin' the funk from the Hennessy. This is the Hindu Shimar Shin between the Dooley boy and the Hennessy. The three nicely hung sepoys are Hennessy, Dooley, and the Hindu Shimar Shin. The Hindu being a mashup of Hennessy and Dooley. Note that this spelling of Hindu was not uncommon in Joyce's day, so this is not necessarily a neologism. That is to say, the two Irish, or possibly Irish-American, sepoys combine with and into the third to a merged anti-colonial, anti-Wellington figure. Here they are confronting, laughing at, and generally insulting Wellington. In his A First Draft Version of Finnegan's Wake, David Heyman reproduces Joyce's sketch in pencil of the battlefield of Waterloo and depicts the three soldiers, one with the Shem Sigla, one with the Sean Sigla, and the one between, a combination of the two. Yet Joyce shows the three Sigla for Shem Sean and Shem Sean, the three sepoys, cadets, upside down and flipped below the regular Sigla. Between the two sets of Sigla runs a squiggly line with the ALP Sigla at each end. ALP appears to be depicted as a river or perhaps a channel of urine, recalling the park incident and other stories such as the prank queen, running through the battlefield into which or reflected into which are the regular sigla of the sepoys. This strikes us as a pointer to an irretrievable consciousness. There's something about this river, this feminine energy that transforms the sepoys. Consider that in the Oedipus complex, which we will discuss further on. It is the desire for the love of the mother that drives the entire project. This repressed desire or wish cannot be made to go away, but it can be transformed into neurosis or sublimation with all the complex manifestations that may entail. Wellington is said to pick up the sepoy's three-foiled hat from the blood filth and use it to wipe the ass of his horse, Copenhagen. He posts half of the hat on the tail of his horse. That was the last joke of the willing done. Here too, the three-foiled hat is a single figure comprised of all three colonial constituents, a trinity, and also a shamrock. This makes the Hindu rangy mad for a bomb shub. According to McHugh and Glasheen, this is a reference to a great cricketer of Joyce's time, K.S. Ranjit Singhji, an Indian national playing Britain's game at the highest level. The same figure is also found in the wake as Jam Sahib, again a sepoy, but in the national game instead of the army. The scene culminates as follows. This is the same white horse of the willing Dun, Culpin help, waggling his tail of scrub with the half of a hat of lapoleums to insult on the Hindu sea boy. Nay, nay, nay. Bull's rag, foul. This is the sea boy, Madras Hataras, up jumpin', pumpin', cry to the willing dun, up, puka ro, puka yurap. This is the willing dun, born stable gentleman, tinders his matchbox to the curse again, shimmer shin. But sucker, ye stead. This is the do for him, sea boy. Blow the tail of the half of the hat of Lapoleum's off of the top of the tail on the back of his big white horse. Tip, bullseye, game. How Copenhagen ended. This way, the music room. Mind your boots going out. Vincent Chang has made great work of this section of the wake and of Joyce's use of the image of the horse throughout the wake. The music room episode is filled with references to Wellington's battles and to his grand stature upon his big wide horse. Both Wellington and his horse, and indeed all these imperial men on their horses and with their big white arses, are found in monuments all over the world, including in the colonies, conquered by these great white men on their great white horses. In this story, two military cadets or sepoys combine into a third composite figure who strikes the insurrectionary blow. 
the historical Duke of Wellington himself was dismissed by Napoleon as a sepoy, which he was. According to Vincent Chang, Wellington was, quote, born in Dublin and raised Irish. He was himself one of the dark horses that in this ambivalent discourse of colonial desire trains to become a white horse in a white horse world, as does a Hindu sepoy or Rajput cricketer, end quote. Thus Joyce places the Hindu at the center and margins of the space where colonial and anti-colonial discourses meet, grapple, annihilate each other, and recombine across contested borders and cultures, north and south, east and west. Wellington here is the quintessential imperialist general and overlord, needing but profoundly dismissive of the many sepoys in his army hailing from the living ditches of the colonies. He has insulted the sepoys by using their hat to wipe his horse's ass, and then furthered the insult by posting half that hat on its tail. This hat is a symbol of Ireland, that is the trefoil or Irish shamrock, and also refers to the Catholic religion, the Trinity. Wellington's presence in Dublin is established by the monument to him of in, of course, Phoenix Park. In Joyce, Race and Empire, Vincent Cheng argues that in the Musy Room episode and elsewhere, Joyce clearly ties Wellington to King Billy, King William III of Orange, the conqueror of Ireland at the Battle of the Boyne, which is conflated in the wake with the Battle of Waterloo. Thus, while the sepoys are a combined figure of colonial resistance, the authoritarian figures of Wellington and King William III are, are a combined imperialist figure. The oppression and resistance to that oppression in India and Ireland are merged. Shimarshin, the Hindu sea boy, the combined Irish-Indian figure up jumps and curses Wellington, yelling, Ap Pukaru, Puka Yurap. Puka is slang and can be taken to mean authentic, and was sometimes a prefix to Sahib, thus suggesting the person was of high status, a true Sahib, but also suggesting an overbearing and patriarchal figure. It also has the sound here of Fuck Yurap, and it comes with no small amount of sarcasm saluting the Puka Sahib with a bomb. Wellington yells back along the lines of, go fuck yourself, ba sukur stead, at which point the Hindu throws his bomb, knocking the hat, horse, and Wellington to the ground. Thus, a profoundly phallocentric symbol of imperialism is dehorsed by the Hindu sepoy from the living ditches, all in a story told by the Irish janitrix, Kate. The sepoys and Kate both seem to represent the subaltern. Kate, a janitrix, has taken us through the Wellington Museum and spoken not with the voice of authority, of a docent, let alone, say, a director. Her voice and perspective have pretty much nothing in common with the colonizer's voice and perspective on Wellington and the Battle of Waterloo and British rule. A battle in which, far from being dehorsed, Wellington was the victor. The sepoys have cursed the imperialist in a mashup of destroyed English and Hindustani, the language of colonial nonsense, and thrown a bomb at him. And Joyce has thrown a bomb into the English language. Mind your boots going out, indeed. The identity formation of the Hindu sea boy merges east and west, north and south, merged in opposition to the authoritarian colonial ruler and archetypal authority figure. But these identity formations in the wake are never simple, just as they aren't simple in real life. As noted earlier, Wellington him himself was a sea boy. A statement attributed to the Duke of Wellington, probably falsely, but nonetheless true of him, in response to being asked if he was Irish, replied, if a gentleman happens to be born in a stable, it does not follow that he should be called a horse. Joyce seems to have been well aware of this, referring to Willing Dunn as a born stable gentleman. Cheng follows Baba in identifying the mimicry of the oppressed, colonized people pretending to be of the colonizer. And this is all well and good for the colonizer as long as the oppressed do not go too far and do not get out of their station. Wellington was the consummate mimicker, more British than the British. But the oppressed themselves often participate in their own oppression as sepoys, gendarmes, corrupt politicians, and all the like. 
The wake and Ulysses and other of Joyce's work is full of such people. Joyce's honesty about this was certainly an important part of the distance between him and the Irish national movement. And as we know in the wake, personalities, generations, genders have a tendency to become unstable, slipping into and out of each other. When Shem and Sean characters merge, they tend to start looking and acting like HCE. Looked at closely, HCE sometimes resembles Shem, more often perhaps Sean. As Chang summarizes it, the music room has the Muse Room thus becomes a collective case study of colonial politics and the dynamics of power. The dynamics of power are also expressed or are an expression of the psychoanalytical and particularly the Oedipus complex. This complex runs through the wake, the sons rising up to topple and replace the father or father figure as here in the Waterloo Muse Room episode. And in the next episode, we will review that of Buckley shooting the Russian general in book two. Once again, Kate enacts a transitional role, moving from the Norwegian Captain episode and into the Button Taft broadcast, through which we are told the story of the shooting of the Russian general. Kate brings the message to tavern keeper Earwicker that his wife summons him upstairs. Kate's is the lone female voice amid the cacophony of male voices in the tavern, and the way she is introduced ties the upcoming Butt and Taff episode to the Musy Room episode, read here by Simon Local. Aged, crafty, numbered, confusionary, overinsured, ever lapsing, accentuated Kate Catherson, clopped, 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 Darcy Dobry, back and along the dancing corridor, as she was going to pimp him, him way boy Wally, and not without a compliment of Kavan and men, uh, between the two death dealing allied divisions and the lines of ready present fire of the corked again upstored, taken and giving the salute, a band your hands going in, bind your heads coming out, and her remote head to herself in a surf alone. A weir povey, willowy, dreavy, drawly, and the patter of sore familiars, a fat of broads and behomians, as she sure snows, poof for a booby, boo. No uses in their moosey foam. The Jamisons is a cook in his hair, and the Genesis is a rap in his hind, and the bulling dong caught the wind up. Here, Bulling Dunn caught the wind up, echoes Willing Dunn get the band up. And there are other echoes of the music fume. Band your hands going in and bind your heads coming out. Tip becomes dip. The battle scene, the Crimean War, to be described and acted by Butt and Taff is something of a palimpsest with the Battle of Waterloo. And we will see that the spectrally combined figure reappears in the form of the Irish sepoy Buckley shooting the Russian general. And note that Kate is shown carefully navigating her way through the lines of the male customers described as if soldiers in battle, with the narration sounding just like Kate's tour of the music room. And this is defender of the feeter of the falter of the former of the first man in Donnelly, a willing toned in with his glance door and his brown, and that born appalled noodlum, the panelite pair's tumult delimitator, Aring, Oliver White. He's as tiff as she's tight, and this is his speak quite hoarse. Dip. We want Bud. We want Bud Butterly. We want Bud Butterly Butterly. And there he is in his Boris Luna, the man that shunned the rocks on Ireland, the man that won the battle of the ball. Order, 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 hand tough. We call on Tancred out of Zexy Flavins to compare with Barnum as you lick done. Order, 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 order. Mr. Master in the chair, we heard it since sung thousand times, how burglary struck the rackers on German. For air and boys, go brawl. Aaron Gabra, an English bastardization of the Irish for Ireland forever. Bud and Taff appear to be two characters on a live radio or television program playing in HCE Porter's Tavern tied closely to the Mutt and Jute episode and roughly based on the Mutt and Jeff cartoon series. 
Television existing only in experimental form at the time, Joyce refers to it as tail lesions. They banter about and are interrupted by bracketed interludes as they approach the retelling of the story of the shooting of the Russian general. As they do so, the identity formations get blurry, but seems to become the sepoy Buckley who shoots the general, and Taff, perhaps another sepoy. But even this is uncertain as the two appear to become merged on the television screen. The spectrally combined figure appears to become a vision of HCE, the Russian general, the father figure. And only after this merger does Butt, as Buckley, carry out the shooting. In the heliotropic knot time, following a fade of transformed tufts and bending its vis version, a metanergic reglow of beaming back, the bared board bombardment screen, if tastefully taught uranium satin, tends to telephone and step up to the charge of a light barricade. Down the photo slope, in single tank pulses, with the bit of twog their text, the mizzled their goats, the reglatter glut, borne by their carnial wows. Spray gun rakes and splits them from a double focus, a granodite, a damnemite, electronite, nickelite, and the scanning fire spot of his gunners traverses the rudelands and luster and sunk sundered lines. Shloss. A gasp of truth leaks out over the casing coatings. Amid a fluorescence of spectacular mephiticism, there calculates through the iconoscope stealthily a still, the figure of a fellow chap in the wall aghast, Popey O'Donoghue, the jezunerol of the Russerets. The Butt and Taff episode has been much discussed as an expression of the Freudian and Jungian Oedipus complex. It hardly needs stating that the theme of the sons replacing the father is essential in the wake. Freud introduced the Oedipal complex in his interpretation of dreams, referred early in the Butt and Taff episode, and may he be too an intrepidation of our dreams. The concept draws, of course, on the Greek myth about a man confused in his identity who kills his father and marries his mother. Reduced to its simplest expression, the Oedipus complex revolves around the child's love or desire for the mother and his view that the father is a rival for the mother's attention and affection. It comes about with the child's awareness of being separate from the mother, of being a separate individual. The awareness of this separation produces anxiety. Dealing with this anxiety produces and influences the nature of the development of the personality, the ego, superego, and various psychoanalytic adaptations, including neurosis. This basic conflict is repeated throughout the wake. The seminal incident in Phoenix Park, whatever may have actually happened there, includes suggestions of conflict between sons, the cadets, and the father figure, HCE, over females, H ALP in her youthful expression, with suggestions of incestuous motive or action, including some anal and or homosexual desires. This basic setup underlies many other wake episodes, including the Musy Room episode, which includes iterations of all these same identity for formations, and most importantly for our analysis here, the button taft development of the episode of Buckley shooting the Russian general. The culmination of the Butt and Taff episode brings together the Oedipal journey to a fully independent personality, psychologically and sexually, and the political independence of the nationalist movement. It also contains at least hints of the move towards spiritual independence or freedom. Once this Oedipal project is complete, the shooting of the father figure, Butt and Taff are formally merged into a single character. Butt tells us, Seval Shimar's pleasant time pangs. Recall that in the Musi room, the Hindu is named Shimar Shin, a version of a name common for sepoy soldiers in India, Shimar Singh, or line of battle. So there are Indian sepoys present, perhaps Butt and Taff themselves, or perhaps the third sepoy from the merger of the two. There are a number of suggestions of Indic influence here, including the relevution of the Karma Life Order, Yoga Koga, Governor Jagannath Punjab 
wood was wood, and especially churopodvas, from Sanskrit meaning something like a cut off foot, which is followed by a reference to Butt's fifth foot, suggesting that as he looks upon the Russian general, Butt may be getting an erection, and perhaps also fearing castration, the cut off foot. Butt refers to himself as a cadet, a sepoy in Wellington's army, tying himself to both the Musee Room episode and the Phoenix Park incident, and reaches the denouement, but tells us we insurrectioned, and I shut up. Butt and Taff now become formally combined into a single character, not unlike the Hindu in the Musee Room episode. And with this, Joyce merges several dynamic psychoanalytical, historical, and spiritual complexes. The psychosexual Oedipal project, Freud, the insurrection of proletarian revolution, Marx, and the yogic tantric path to liberation. But and Taff. Desperate slave wager and foeman feudal unshackled, now one and the same person. Their fight upheld to right for a wee while being baffled and tottered, umbrage by the shadow of old Urge's magisqua mythical mulatto militiaman. Out of completion of the Oedipal project, the combined button taff appear without links to mother or father, politically unshackled, though penniless, complete in their psychoanalytic separation or autonomy. And without falter or murmur or blithe root of softliness, pugnate the pledge of fianaship, duke to duke, with a common turn, a whoosh of best man and best man. Swadesia salve, shin fine, we ourselves. The oppressor has been overthrown, dehorsed, shot. The Oedipal father has been killed, and the sons have come into their own full genital sexual power. We even get a little nod to the common turn, the Communist International. Now this may all be rather temporary and actually uncertain, but for now it is done. What we have in the Butt and Taff episode is far from a resolution of the contradictions underlying these complexes. The post edible colonial tantric self remains profoundly neurotic, oppressed and un unenlightened. More work must be done. The cycle of birth, death, and rebirth continues. There is also a layer of potential spiritual liberation in this merged state. We speculate that butt and taff may be taken as top and bottom, but top. On page 370 of The Wake. While we cannot yet demonstrate this genetically, we believe butt and taff can be taken as the muladhara, bottom, and sahasrara, top chakras in yoga. In the Night Lessons episode involving Dolph and Kev and another of the brother oppositions, Joyce directly references the yogic chakras and ties them to the Irish national struggle and to another combination of two soldiers into one. In this image from page 303 of The Wake, we have the well-known yogic chakras lifted in, listed in the left-hand margin, while the text discusses the conflict and merger of Daniel O'Connor and the socialist revolutionary James Connolly with or into Parnell. The merger of Button Taff as the Muladhara, sacral, and Sahasrara, Fontanella chakras in yogic thinking represents the state of enlightenment. Joyce sums it all up with Upanishadam, up and atom boys, and top, ergo bra. Joyce merges the political insurrectionary with the spiritual quest for freedom, moksha, and all this layered with the psychoanalytical Oedipus project culminating in full psychosexual adulthood independence, freedom, independence, liberation, politically, psychoanalytically, and spiritually. Of course, as is so often the case in the wake and in life, political independence may just result in another form of repressive political structure. Adult psychosexual independence may result in neurosis and sin, and spiritual freedom may not hold. As Joyce puts it in book four, novena is over. Nirvana, the Buddhist framing of liberation or moksha, is over. And we return then to the beginning again in the continuous flow of samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Swadesha salve, shin fine. As we discussed at the beginning, book four begins with a call to insurrection 
which can just as easily be read as a call to enlightenment. Calling all downs, calling all downs to Dane, a ray surrection, swadeja salve, son fine, son fine awan. We ourselves, forward. But the river goes on flowing, cycling, recirculating, right back through to another cycle of the great ages or yogic yugas. Mind your boots going out.